Also at the time, we didn't really have a concept of recovery mental health, particularly for serious mental health illnesses. So when, when I was uh, ill during the uh, late 80s and uh, early 90s, there was no kind of real concept of people with a serious mental illness recovering. By 2000, things had changed significantly, and we increasingly saw an emphasis on recovery. But at no time in that point, certainly for me, was anyone watching my physical health. Something that we know is that if you have a serious mental illness, you're much more likely to die at a younger age. Estimates show that that can be 12 to 19 years earlier than the general population. And the main cause of that is physical health problems, long-term physical health problems. We know that to be a fact. So when we are treating someone within the mental health system, and that is likely to be long-term ongoing treatment, we know that in later life, there's a physical health impact. That might be people experiencing a severe mental illness, having a uh, higher prevalence uh, of cardiovascular diseases. We know that in depression, it's two to three times more common for people to experience cardiovascular diseases. Mental illness increases the risk of diabetes and diabetic complications. We again know that comorbid depression worsens clinical outcomes and increases the chances of people experiencing type 2 diabetes. And whilst across the general population, we've made big strides in tackling the causes of cancer, a person with a serious mental illness is still two and a half times more likely to develop cancer than the general population. Risk factors that we know of include smoking, poor diet, low levels of exercise, stress, antipsychotic medication, poverty is a big factor, alcohol, but also within the health system, diagnostic overshadowing, a lack of physical health checks, and a lack of physical health interventions, particularly at the early stages of mental health care treatment. We campaign for better access to mental health services, but actually at the same time, we're overlooking the problems of accessing services around our physical health. Just to give a little bit of background on me, I started smoking regularly at 14 years of age. That's a big red flag. The following year, I was drinking alcohol regularly and excessively. So I was 15 by that stage. Uh, another big red flag. And between 1991 and 2000, I had frequent psychiatric hospital admissions. Two or three hospital admissions every year, often for at least a month. Again, that's another red flag that there may be a future with physical health complications. 2000 and 2001, I started my recovery. Um, I stopped drinking alcohol for a start. My admissions to hospital uh, stopped. Smoking cessation was not encouraged. Actually, it was common for people to say, you're doing so well, let's not do anything to change what's going on. This isn't the right time to stop smoking. So smoking was never an issue that was addressed by the mental health system. We want recovery to look like a nice straightforward line where we go from illness back to something like normality, whatever normality means. That's the myth of recovery. We actually know that that journey can be quite messy. Um, and there's lots of twists and turns along that journey. And within that, as we recover mentally, 
we might then start to recognize that there are things not going too well with our physical health. Running the clock forward a little bit, 15 years later, I finally stopped smoking. I had made the successful transition back to work. I was married with a family, no hospital admissions for 15 years. From a recovery point of view, that looks good. However, 2015, I was diagnosed with asthma. 2019, I had a di diagnosis of diabetes type 2. And in 2021, I needed major open heart surgery. All of that looks as though it's because of previous lifestyle issues. Recovery is not just about our mental health recovery. It's about a whole process of looking at our health, managing illness and symptoms, making informed choices both to support our physical and our emotional well-being. It's looking at our home situation, having a stable and safe place to live, and a purpose, reconnect, reconnecting with meaningful daily activities, having independence, and being part of the wider community, having those relationships, those social networks, those friendships and love. But we need to, an approach that treats the whole person, both in terms of health and in so, social care, looking at all of the factors that go on for that. But today, I want us to think about what a different approach looks like. Risk factors associated with long-term physical health conditions are still prevalent for people like myself with a background and a lived and living experience of serious mental health issues. We need to look at how we can start to address physical health seriously and from an early stage. Why is diagnostic shadow overshadowing still an issue? Why do we still have poor access to regular physical health checks as routine? And knowing that a mental health condition can lead to physical health problems in later life, what physical health interventions can we build in for an early stage through to recovery? Once I'd recovered, I was discharged from the mental health system, and then this assumption that everything was normal. No, no one looked to tackle that 20, 25 years of abuse that my, my body took uh, through my, my experiences of living with a mental health condition. We also need to think about the language that we use there, because it would be easy and is easy to use language and approaches that can be accused of fat shaming or, sh or patient, patient blaming. So we really need to start thinking together with people with, with lived and living experiences of how best we tackle those physical health issues that are still prevalent for people today. With that, I'm going to hand back over and open up for questions and discussion. Thanks, Chris. That's fantastic and a, a really powerful example of a life trajectory and hopefully something that, that's going to be a thing of the past. So uh, there's an opportunity uh, to, for questions from the floor or comments from the floor. Um, I might, uh, uh, Chris, I, I know last time you spoke you talked about your open heart surgery and some of the uh, uh, secondary, I guess, uh, outcomes from that in terms of your mental health. Can you tell us, talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I had hope in a heart surgery in October 2021. Uh, as I said, uh, that that was as a, probably as a result of uh, some of the uh, health issues that had been uh, ongoing and prevalent throughout my, my background. Uh, it was complicated in the fact that two months after heart surgery, I also uh, 
uh, lost a kidney uh, because of a surgery complication. However, one of the one of the things that that uh, was different about that serious experience of physical health problems and potentially life threatening health problems was the psychological impact of that. Uh, it was very, very different psychological impact to the psychological impacts I'd felt uh, during my, my, my severe bouts of depression. Uh, by this stage, I was well into recovery. I had a sense of purpose and identity. I knew where I wanted to be. And then you have this physical health problem that can interfere with that. That can be a serious knockback. And we know that physical health conditions can have a big impact on our mental health and well-being. One of the things that was very, very fortunate for me and is not generally routine was that I had access to uh, cardiac psychology. And cardiac psychology took a, t t took a very, very different approach of looking at the very serious issues that I, I may face moving forward uh, that may not change. Um, and looking at how we address or, or over manage the, the, those issues going forward. That was really, really useful in that process of maintaining my mental health during a stage of high anxiety around my physical health. Great. Thanks, Chris. So we have another question from the floor. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chris. My name's Sharon. Um, something you said during your talk resonated where you would said um, once your mental health uh, was um, better managed that you then could talk and think more to your physical health. I'm wondering if you would think back because often, you know, it's well down the track by then and you've established physical health conditions. So is there anything that you would say or do differently or suggest, um, particularly for the health professionals in the room, but for also for consumers and families to try and move that clock back <laughs> earlier? Um, I, it was just interesting what you said, that it wasn't until after your mental health was um, steadier that you had headspace to think about your physical health was what I took from what you said. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I, I date my recovery to, to early 2000, mainly because that's where my last hospital admission was. And, and so it's a nice, easy point. Um, you know, when I, and, and when I started to recover, I think it was probably about a year, two years after that point that I kind of looked back and went, oh, I've not been in hospital. What's going on here? And and you, it, there's not this moment of psychic change. Then there's this gradual process. But at two years, thing, things were stable. Uh, things were looking good. Uh, I was managing uh, without crisis intervention. That was the first time in, in a long, long time. Um, I guess it was probably around 2010, so 10 years after that point, when I started kind of going, what about my physical health? And started to approach uh, my uh, general practitioner and, and other health services of, of, you know, okay, I need to start thinking about my physical health. But it was me that had to be proactive in that. Um, whilst in the, at that sort of early stage of recovery, I was still getting support from mental health services. And there's this kind of thing where it feels as though you're either unwell or you're now well and functioning. There, there's no transition in that care. And I think you know, at that two year point where you suddenly where, where for me, I kind of had this awakening that things have changed. Actually, that might have been a good point to start having those discussions um, of, of 
okay, what do we need to address? We've got 25 years of, of poor maintenance of physical health. What do we need to start addressing? But that that intervention didn't didn't happen at any stage. It's Chris, I'm just conscious of the. Oh, we got one one last one last quick question. Um, perhaps at the back. Uh, uh, sorry, we've got to give everyone a turn. So, um, and, and while Sonia's going back with the microphone, uh, I think that's such a great point when we think about you know you talk about holistic health, and in in mental health and health we go oh the person's okay now they're good now, but really. This is when we should be doing promotion, health promotion and preventive action to avoid the heart transplants and the loss of kidney 20 years later. We should understand that this is a risk factor, 20 years in sort of mental health services, et cetera. So the people are just not, not ill or well. We need to keep thinking about a health promotion, prevention, early intervention uh, about everybody's, particularly you know, in GP land and also uh, you know, any clinician, really. Um, last quick question. Yes, it's, it's a comment, really, I guess, for professionals as well, is that because of interaction, a lot of interactions with the health service, I was scared of health services. And I have a trauma background as well. So when my physical health does need addressing, my mental health is not addressed. They don't consider the impact of that having to get treatment and how it affects my mental health. And that's been so deterring for me to get my physical health taken care of because of that past trauma. Mm. Uh, Chris, did you have a comment, in, uh, a response in, uh, in response to that comment? Yeah, I think you know. At, at the end, I said we need to be we we need to be mindful of the approaches that we take. Um, and I'd mentioned it's very easy to for for people to feel as though they are blamed for uh, their physical health conditions. But also, yes, we may have had uh, poor experiences or traumatic experiences. Uh, particularly with, with things like diagnostic overshadowing. When I go to a doctor and they kind of go, well, actually, that's probably just down to your mental health without, without, ex without exploring that, um, you know, that is going to put people off accessing physical health services. Also, you know, we're, all, we're, we're aware that we may have done damage to our bodies and there's a fear in, in moving forward to... to physical health care supports, a fear of, well, what actually might we find? So we need to think about how we work with people with lived and living experiences to, to bridge that, that, that divide that can exist there between access to services. Um, yeah, Chris, thank you. I think you've given a, a fantastic uh, lived experience picture of the complexity and the trajectory that we, you know, we're working with and seek to improve every day. So on behalf of us here, can we please all thank Chris White. <laughs>